crossing the Jordan. In the year of the world unknown to modern calendars, when the earth was young and the heavens uncharted by stellar science loomed large and prophetic above the sons and daughters of men, there transpired events of such cosmic significance they have reverberated through the fragile thread of human history. It was in this primal age, beneath the churning leaden skies that bore down upon the earth with oppressive might, that the children of Israel, those ancient and chosen few, found themselves standing upon the dank and mist-covered banks of the river known to them as the Jordan. The air was thick with vapors that rose from the river, swirling in hypnotic patterns as if sentient and purposeful. The waters themselves flowed not as the natural courses of the world men now know, but seemed to pulsate with the rhythms of some distant Stygian sea, their undulations speaking of realms not set within the safe boundaries of maps and explorations. Joshua, he who had taken the mantle from Moses, the architect of Exodus, was a figure of solemn and brooding aspect, his eyes deep-set beneath a brow furrowed with the inscriptions of many unspoken horrors, held the fire of one who has gazed into abysses unmeasurable by the finite geometries of our world. He was plagued by dreams, nay by waking visions bestowed upon him by the inscrutable Yahweh, visions that spoke of fates far worse than the bondage they had fled in Egypt, a land itself not unfamiliar with ancient and nameless blasphemies crawling from the shifting sands. Around Joshua thronged the masses of his kinsfolk, their countenances a tapestry of awe, faith, and the dawning realization of a terror that stalked them, not in the shapes of men or beasts, but as an ever-present shadow, an intangible and unspeakable dread that whispered with the wind through the reeds and the murmurs of the dark waters before them. There, amidst the assembly, borne on sacred staves by figures robed in consecrated vestments of a bygone priesthood, was that most eldritch and arcane artifact, the Ark of the Covenant. A thing of shrouded histories and powers, it was said to be a conduit of the divine, a bridge between the world of mortals and the terrible majesty of a god who spoke in thunder and shattered the minds of those who dared behold his countenance. The Ark, an object of both sanctity and horror, seemed to throb with a power that was not entirely of this earth, pulsating in rhythm with the ebbing twilight and the chimeric energies that gathered with the coming night. As the last rays of the sun, blood-red and portentous, were devoured by hungry, darkening clouds, Joshua, imbued with the strength and despair of a man who acts not of his own accord, but by the dictates of omnipotent design, raised his hand toward the ominous waters. The Israelites, their souls a tempest of faith battling the primal fears of their kind, knew then that they were not merely wanderers in a desolate land, they were pilgrims on the border of a reality that yawned wide before them, a realm where their god, a cosmic entity of incomprehensible power, held dominion not only over their fates, but over the very fabric of reality itself, a tapestry that was now, under the gathering shadows, beginning to unravel in terrifying ways. As the cloak of night drew itself around the world, smothering the last vestiges of daylight in its inky embrace, the Israelites, that band of ancient wanderers, stood at the precipice of the otherworldly, of realms uncharted and unimagined by the souls of men. In their midst, the chosen priests, their countenances obscured beneath sacred garbs that whispered of forgotten rites and celestial hierarchies, stepped forth. They were the bearers of that most potent and dreaded artifact, the Ark of the Covenant, around which the very air seemed to pulse with unseen currents and cryptic vibrations, as if reality itself recoiled from its immeasurable sanctity. The throng of humanity on the river's brink, caught in the throes of a reverent hysteria, found their voices united in a choral outpouring so mournful, so imbued with the pent sorrows and hopes of a people touched by divine terror, that it seemed less a song of men and more a dirge resonating through time immemorial. This lamentation, born from the depths of their collective soul, wove an auditory tapestry, 
a sound that seemed to twist the very air, making the atmosphere dense with some formless expectant energy. The waters of the Jordan, reflecting the Stygian skies above, began to tremble as if the riverbed quaked at the stirrings of some leviathan disturbed in its murky repose. The surface of the water bulged and warped, and an unholy cacophony, like the hissing of a thousand serpentine entities, rose from its depths. And then, with a sound like the rending of the firmament itself, the waters parted. They recoiled from the path that lay ahead of the Covenant's bearers, withdrawing with apparent sentience and dread, leaving in their wake a trough of barren, moisture-stripped earth. This path, this sudden valley in the aqueous barrier, was submerged in an otherworldly darkness that seemed to drink the feeble light of the stars, creating a void in the very space it occupied. The walls of water that loomed on either side held within their quivering bulwarks faces, scenes and cosmic dances of alien worlds and times, as if the liquid barriers had become windows into the abysses between the stars, into the dark corners of existence where sentient beings dared not tread. The Israelites, their song now a quivering whisper of what it had been, moved as one. Compelled by the unspoken command that thrummed through the air, vibrating in their very bones, they stepped onto the path that had been violently carved through the river's heart. Each footfall seemed both sacrilege and salvation as they tread the shadow-drenched corridor, flanked by the impossible heaving masses of the Jordan's cloven waters. Joshua, his soul aflame with the terrible clarity of his divine burden, led them. His eyes, reflecting the chaos of the sundered river, were the eyes of a man who, having seen the boundaries of the world dissolve, walks ever forward into the embrace of nightmares untold, into the gaping maw of cosmic desolation that yawned wide before them, beckoning them into the darkness that is the unknowable mind of God. The cloven waters of the Jordan stood as monoliths to the impossible, their trembling forms etching a path of nightmarish surrealism through which the children of Israel were compelled to tread. The darkness within this earthen channel was not merely the absence of light, but seemed a physical entity, a mass of shadow and suggestion that pressed close upon them, its density broken only by the ghostly, otherworldly glow that emanated from the ark, a luminescence that did not so much pierce the gloom as highlight the contours of its malevolence. The melody, once robust amongst the congregation, now faltered, a fragile shimmer of sound amidst the devouring silence. It hung around them like a protective shroud, its vibrations a threadbare shield against the burgeoning terrors that the parting of the waters had unveiled. For it was not merely a path they had opened, but a wound, from this gaping moor in the river's continuum, there arose not the scent of fresh water or wet earth, but a brackish stench of decay, an olfactory testament to the corruption of natural law. And from the quivering walls that flanked their passage, there emerged figures spectral and vengeful, their translucent forms twisted in expressions of eternal anguish, the damned souls perhaps of those who had perished in the cataclysm at the Red Sea, their rest now disturbed by the cosmic resonance of the Ark. These wraiths, drawn like moths to the eldritch flame of the relic, reached forth with ethereal fingers, their wails of longing and hate melding with the sound of turbulent waters to create a symphony of pure dread. Their ghostly touches, cold as the abyss and burning with the fires of regret, brushed the skin of the trembling Israelites, each contact a blasphemy, an abomination of the divide between life and death. Amidst this chaos of sound and sensation, Joshua's voice, touched with the horror of his visions, commanded twelve among them to stoop within the mire of the riverbed. What they retrieved were objects of such obscene nature that the mind rebelled at their recollection. They were akin to eyes, large and grotesque, but melted and deformed, as if they had witnessed sights so unspeakable that their very substance had been undone. These remnants, pulsating with a sickly life of their own, seem to hail from epochs long before the dawn of man, their presence there a testament to the unknowable truths that lay hidden beneath the veneers of reality. 
Each of the twelve held an eye, their features twisted in a mix of reverence and revulsion, the oozing, quivering organs an unbearable burden that they were nonetheless compelled to bear. These then were their tokens, their anchors to the realm of human ordeal from which they had been so violently sundered. And as they trudged forward through the nightmare-forged pathway, these eyes, remnants of beings from the darkness between the stars, seemed to weep tears of black ichor, as if mourning a future of despair written in the annals of both heaven and earth. The trek through the Sundered River was as a journey through the very bowels of cosmic horror, a passage that seemed to stretch not merely across distances measured by the footsteps of weary travelers, but through the endless dark corridors of their own souls. When at last the congregation of Israel, each member a reflection of mortal terror and tenacious faith, emerged from the aqueous chasm, they stepped not simply onto the familiar soils of their earthly realm, but also into a new phase of existence, forever altered by the shadows that had caressed their very essences. Behind them, with a roar that seemed to echo the collective relief of a multitude, the waters of the Jordan crashed back into their rightful domain. The ghastly ethereal hands that had so desperately sought to cling to the material world receded, sinking beneath the frothing waves, pulled into the unfathomable depths from whence they had come. The river, now whole again, flowed as if it had not been witness to the passage of an entire people through its dissected heart, as if the laws of nature had not been grotesquely twisted under the weight of divine intervention. The Israelites, their bodies trembling from exertion and cold, their spirits barely clinging to the shreds of what they had known, gathered at the behest of Joshua under the uncaring, distant stars that now seemed to leer rather than twinkle in the heavens above. In the hands of the Twelve, the grotesque stones, once melted and misshapen, relics of a horror unearthed, were miraculously transformed. No longer were they the ocular remains of some ineffable creature, but they had become whole, smooth and symmetrical, their surfaces catching the starlight and reflecting it back as if within each was a universe unto itself. With hands guided by some force that whispered on the edge of perception, the Twelve placed the stones in a circle, each stone a sentinel, each gap a gateway of potential, this monument, erected on the shores of the river that had been their damnation and salvation, was not merely a testament to their survival. It was a beacon, a signal to all who would come after that here was a boundary, and those who had crossed had seen the realms beyond the veil of sanity. As the world around them seemed to exhale, the leaves of the trees rustling with the pent-up breath of the earth, the Israelites, under Joshua's haunted gaze, understood with a clarity born of their harrowing exodus. They had traversed more than a mere river, they had walked along the fragile boundary that separates the known from the unimaginable. They had been watched by the silent, ageless sentinels of creation and had been deemed worthy to continue their pilgrimage. With hearts heavy with knowledge never sought, and minds alight with a purpose that no longer bore the simplicity of mortal conquest, they turned their faces toward the promised land. It lay before them, not as a gift to be received, but as a challenge to be met and understood, a realm to be revered and feared in the same breath. For they now walked under the gaze of primordial watchers, their paths guided by the unseen hands that mold the destinies of men and gods alike. We hope you enjoyed this story. It would greatly help to support our creators if you liked the video and subscribe to the channel. Also check out the playlist in the description. Thank you very much and we hope to see you next time.